And so here's another example that goes into another use of the Apostles' Creed. So standing before me as a radiant beauty, indescribable in human terms, the Blessed Virgin Mary had greeted me as I left my body, watching my physical form lying down with my youngest son below. For a moment, it seemed that I might be experiencing death, but the Virgin directed me to observe my sweet baby boy. Coming from in sight of his spirit, I could see stirring as if he were perhaps praying for me in some way. In sight of him, I could see my two daughters and their prayers for me also. Suddenly, a very thin light beam came forth from his body directly into my soul, pulling it back into my body. Knowing this beam was the result of my children's prayers, the Virgin allowed me to witness the, this event over and over again showing me that I was not incorrect in determining that my situation was quite tentative. She conveyed that I was still alive because of the prayers of my children. Wearing a veil of dark blue with stars around her head, her face was filled with light and appeared pale because of the effect of the light coming through her. Upon her breast, she wore a lighter blue robe, which contrasted that of her outer garment. Thank you for allowing me to see you, I said excitedly. I am honored. Without words, she raised her hands as I was sent back to my body. Amidst the crowded astral streets, my spirit was approached by a young woman who claimed that her house was haunted. As she came towards me, I offered to help and handed her a business card which said, Marilyn Hughes, Ghost Hunter. In the physical world, I do not have such a card, so I found it amusing. <laughs> As I discovered over the past two years, many hauntings are actually caused by three different types of phenomenon, demonic spirits, lost souls, and those doing their purgatory upon the earth. Each of these three types of hauntings or poltergeist phenomenon requires different spiritual approaches in order to affect a successful outcome. When entering the home, I was unable to discern of which type we were dealing with because of the excessive poltergeist activity in the home. Poltergeist activity can often be linked by de two demonic spirits, but on occasion, such extreme forms of haunting can be perpetrated by lost souls or purgatorial wards. If this is the case, it is usually because the soul is still carrying a great deal of anger about something. In this particular home, there were a lot of flying objects, and it was what I'd term to be a very unfriendly haunting. Having met the woman's husband, who is now waiting inside the house with me, his wife awaited the result outside. Are you ready to go to work? I asked him as he nodded that he was. Repeating several Catholic prayers over and over, we entered the house. Starting with the Apostles' Creed, my voice slowly trailed through the room. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, who was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, paused for dramatic effect, turned, and walked around the room before continuing and rose again on the third day, returning to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and life everlasting. Tentatively observing me, the young husband didn't quite know what to think. Hail, Holy Queen, I began to recite the Catholic prayer of the same name. Mother of mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To thee do we cry, poor banished children of Eve. To thee do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. Turn then, most gracious advocate, thine eyes of mercy towards us. And then after this, our exile, show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary, pray for us, O Holy Mother of God that we may be worthy of the promises of Christ. At this time, I began a sermon about Jesus Christ, pounding on a table to give emphasis to my words. I spoke of his majesty and the fact that our salvation comes from him. 
my spirit cannot remember the details of this fairly long endeavor. However, but as I finished my sermon, my spirit quickly returned to prayer. Hail Mary, I shouted, beginning the prayer of the same name. Full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. At this moment, two spirits materialized clearly in front of me, completely de-energized in their violent activity. Lying on the floor, I approached and sat down with them. Sitting upright, a middle-aged woman had appeared whose garments were changing from their former color, which I could not discern, to a very light beige. A young Oriental woman was lying beside her, and her garments had changed from their former color to a gown of whitest white. Immediately, a young baby boy appeared at her side, and she directed me to pick him up and cuddle him. Although he appeared immediately upon their materialization, he had not been a part of the haunting of this home. An angel was waiting at his side, a luminous, clear, whitish being with large wings. Clearly, the baby was already in heaven, but was taken to his mother's side at the moment of her redemption. Conveying to me that this was her child, the young Oriental woman expressed deep anger and regret at the young husband who lived in this home, who was apparently a former boyfriend. His guilty look made clear his sin against her, but he honestly hadn't known that she was pregnant or that she and the baby had died. During her purgatory on earth, she had joined together with this older woman who had chosen to assist her in engaging in poltergeist activity. Directed towards the one whom she held accountable for her wasted and lost life, she knew she'd sacrificed her potential on the altar of, vice, of the vice of lust, the many prayers I'd offered for them had begun to purify their souls, which had manifested in new garments of white and beige, respectively. Inherently, I understood that they were both now prepared to enter into heaven, although the older woman apparently still had some purification to undergo. Despite this need, she was to be released from her purgatory upon the earth and taken to a higher purgation site very near to the entrance of heaven or she would go shortly. The young girl, however, was ready to join her tiny baby in heaven. Calling the young man over, the two souls had a moment of atonement with one another. Forgiveness seemed to be given and all awaited what was to happen next. Directing them to kneel with me on the floor, I said, now it's time for us to pray you into heaven. Bowing their heads, we commenced our prayer. Joining me as they slowly learned the words, they disintegrated many times, many minutes later. Above them, I saw the angels in whose hands they had been given, and I bid them a wondrous journey to the ultimate place of Bilius, our heavenly homeland. And there you can see the two, two prayers, the Hail Mary and the Hail Holy Queen, along with the Apostles' Creed again being of real importance in that combat. Mm -hmm. Another demonstration of the importance of St. Michael's prayer. Let's, let me just say St. Michael's prayer for those who don't know it. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, thrust into hell Satan and all evil spirits who wander through the world for the ruin of souls. Amen. And so, swept before the entry of our home, an amazing sight stood before my soul. About 40 feet high, St. Michael stood as a winged man, wearing the garments of a warrior, but his essence was a dark, smoky substance which I knew to be the energy of the wrath and justice of God. 
Behind him, St. Joseph appeared twice, as if there were two of them, one on each side of St. Michael, holding the infant Jesus. St. Joseph remained silent, but exhibited the power of no words. Perhaps in this there lay a clue. Perhaps my words were not well chosen because there were too many of them. <laughs> my encounters with others, I had a tendency to get involved in debates over the Lord. I don't do that anymore. <laughs> Thank God. So exhausting. <laughs> from the Talmudic anthology, from Peshahim, number 323, stanza five. If silence be good for wise men, how much better it must be for fools. <laughs> St. Michael moved with the mind of God, and although he seemed to embody God's justice and wrath, there was no wrath. St. Michael crushed demons with no emotional attachment. It was simply his purpose. His power was so great, he could crush a demon with a single sweep of his hand, sometimes with only a thought. But St. Michael exhibited peace in his work and was not angry. He just did his job of crushing darkness and their consorts with no emotional concern. Handing me a report card, I got all A's with one exception for words I had merited a B. <laughs> so shocking. <laughs> St. Michael then allowed me to witness one of his prime functions, taking me to an energetic prison. St. Michael showed me that the souls of incarnate mankind who are chaotic, and dangerous are held energetically. St. Michael energetically prevents them from causing the total mass destruction they would cause if left to their own will. Allowing me to participate in restraining them, I quickly realized how difficult this was. So violently out of control, it took a great deal of concentration to hold them in place and to restrain their destructive impulse. As I was easily overcome, St. Michael took pity on me and restrained the prisoners with only a thought, demonstrating to me the huge grace the Lord had given this special angel. Saying nothing, St. Michael and St. Joseph disappeared, but left behind them three huge statues that showed protection before the front door. Bowing to the Lord, I thank God and his many angels for his protection from Taharis Halishon, it says man's power of speech is a spiritual force and it has great effect in the higher spheres. Consequently, the damage wrought by improper speech in the higher worlds is severe and awesome, and the greater the damage, the greater is the punishment. And from the New American Bible, it says, I tell you on the day of judgment, people will render an account for every careless word they speak. By your words, you will be acquitted, and by your words, you will be condemned. And then we have another experience with St. Michael from Galactica. And it's an ominous in his court. The celestial sphere was overrun by beautiful music, which made it more difficult to concentrate. Floating in heavenly spheres, we were surrounded by the stars. Though a barrier clearly existed around us, the walls of the space were invisible. The celestial vision of the heavens was so earth-shatteringly stunning, it was excruciatingly painful knowing I could not stay here forever. Inside of our heads, an instructor showed us what appeared to be a cyclone of energy, which looked like a small tornado whirling within our brain at great speed. Pointing into deep space and guiding our eyes back down to the earth below, the instructor now allowed us to watch as incredible laser beams of light appeared, originating from heaven and continuating, continuing all throughout the vast expanse of space to the earth below. Amazingly, we were told that these were the lines of the Holy Spirit flowing from heaven to earth. Placed into a sitting and meditative position, we were directed to lean back our upper body in an attempt to have these cyclones Within our heads, meet with the line of the Holy Spirit. The alignment had to be just perfect for the intended effect to occur, and this was very difficult. But we were told that when that alignment hits synchronicity, you'll be swept away immediately. 
As they said this, they had snapped their fingers to indicate the quickness of the alteration. Trying many times before I could make this link, it didn't come easily, but finally hitting the alignment perfectly, my soul was instantly transported to another location. No bliss can ever hope to attain that which was now my own. Riding on the back of a gigantic being approximately 40 feet tall, I was leaning upon his neck and shoulders, looking directly into his face, which happened to be larger than my spiritual body. Small in comparison to him, I was like a little mouse sitting upon a person's shoulder. Looking into his eyes, I felt a serene wisdom which surpassed everything. Blank and tan, his eyes were the color of his skin while we were traveling the earth, uniquely fashioned to bring focus to the Lord. Falling gently below his ears, his somewhat curly and flowing hair was of a blondish brown color. But as we shot off into space, his features took on a violet and white color, reflecting the colors of the galactic heavens. Before I had a chance to realize what had happened to me, I'd entered into the power of this individual, feeling an incredible thrust of heavenly propulsion. In some ways, it was as though I were riding on the back of a rocket, as St. Michael the Archangel was taking me for a ride. Patrolling the earth, looking for loose demons, I noticed that he was going after those which were not specifically attached to souls. Those demons which were already inside of people were left alone for this particular journey, as those who were lucidly looking for prey were immediately annihilated. St. Michael literally snapped these demons up in his two forefingers, pinching their neck and tossing them aside as they fell back to the pit. Along the way, St. Michael found several dogs that were possessed by demons and had become extremely violent. Pinching the neck with one fell sweep of his two fingers, the demons were extricated and annulled. No words exist for the tremendous immensity of the energy pulse, which I was honored to behold while riding upon his back. Circling the earth several times, I was in a state of total ecstasy. During our ride, we came upon several people who were misusing eternal power received unlawfully. Souls in positions of worldly power who had used non-eternal means to achieve their ends. Snapping his fingers, several of these people simply dropped dead in their tracks. Finally, St. Michael was done patrolling the earth for now. And my ride was over. <laughs> So that's the final page of our outline, right? Mm -hmm. The final thing. Now, so what do you want to say to, I don't know, we've been on this little journey here for a couple hours, and so what do you want to leave people with in regards? Because you were guided to come back after we did spiritual warfare, angels and demons preparation, then you came back strong with the combat and you're guided to put this out there. And what are you, what are you hoping to leave people with? I want people to realize that the combat is the next phase and that there's no reason to be afraid. Remember that God is the creator. Satan is the creature. The demonic realm is also creatures. They're fallen creatures. And that it, it can be extremely terrifying when you're brought into the battle and the warfare. But you have to stand in your faith and what you understand to be true, what you know to be true, which is Jesus Christ is their sovereign and they cannot stand. And therefore, you stand in that. You stand with Christ and you will, you will prevail. That's where your strength lies. And then what is, what is the purpose of spiritual warfare? The purpose of the spiritual warfare, it begins with us because we are in the battle of purification of our own souls, which is overcoming the darkness within ourselves and bringing in the light. So we are battling the demons within ourselves, for starters. That's where it begins. Mm -hmm. But then we are also dealing with these battles for others. But what you're going to find is that there is a period of time, sometimes it goes on five or six years, that most souls will go through if they really go into the purification journey. 
the demonic side will battle for your soul. It's part of the purification journey and they're going to come after you hard. If you're really trying to break free from what you've been and where you've been and you want to go forward and you want to finish the journey in this lifetime, heard it from a lot of people and you go through it for a good long time, years, and it does end, but it takes a long time. And then once you're done fighting that battle, that's for yourself, that you're going to find that you're fighting the demons who are coming after you for your own soul, you're going to fight it for other, other people. And you're going to fight it for this realm. And for other souls in this realm, you're going to fight it for the principal, you're going to be involved in the principalities and, and powers warfares that go on, whichever ones you're called into, because basically you're not choosing. Remember, mm -hmm. <laughs> we, we just go wherever we're taken. And so you're going to be called into all of it. And you want to be prepared. And the way you become prepared is be solid in your faith. And your faith is in the knowledge of who God is who Jesus Christ is and where you stand with your faith in him. That's really as simple as it gets. And it doesn't matter, you know, you can, you can have your interest in these other paths and things, but it's just so important that you understand who's in charge in the universal sphere of things and who's got your back. I personally study you know the ancient sacred texts of all these different paths but i understand who jesus christ is and i understand that when it comes to spiritual warfare a mantra isn't going to save me or <laughs> you know what i'm saying i i understand what's required when when we're talking about spiritual combat it's important to know the difference there are different things for different aspects of our spiritual path. When it comes to spiritual warfare, you need to understand Jesus Christ is the one you go to. He's the one you return to. And these are the prayers that hold the power for you. You have to understand that. That's where your safety lies. That's where your power will lie. The protection lies. All of it. It's that simple. And, re and repeat it until it happens. Yeah, you got to repeat, 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 repeat. <laughs> Rinse and you gotta, repeat. Yeah, you got to mean it. You got to mean it. And, and so this is part of understanding it is just you don't have to fully comprehend all the mystery behind it all. You just need to know it. Sometimes people get, don't get caught up in your intellect about all of it. Right. God is a mystery. It's okay that God's a mystery. Mm -hmm. Just start with the knowledge of, okay, so this is it. And um, start there. And God knows what's in our heart. So Right. Build your faith from there. Fantastic. Well, it's been an amazing talk. Is there anything else you'd like to say to wrap this up for now? Now, by the way, we were going to do two other parts to this talk but we decided to uh, forego that. And it was uh, another section on angelology and demonology in, uh, in regards to being connected with spiritual warfare. But we're going to pick that up at another time. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Why don't you hang on one second, though? One sec. Hold on. One sec. Hello. I thought you were going to come back with the Virgin Mary statue. <laughs> so i wanted to share a couple of quotes here so this is something from saint catherine of siena on why god allows the devil to tempt us i've appointed the devil to tempt and to trouble my creatures in this life saint catherine of siena reports that our lord said to her i've done this not so that my creatures will be overcome but so that they may overcome proving their virtue and receiving from me the glory of victory. And no one should fear any battle or temptation of the devil that may come to him because I've made my creatures strong and I've given them strength of will, fortified in the blood of my son. Neither the devil nor any other creature 
can control this free will because it's yours, given to you by me. By your own choice, then, you can hold it or let go of it as you please. It's a weapon. And if you place it in the hands of the devil, it right away becomes a knife that he'll use to stab and kill you. On the other hand, if you don't place this knife that is your will into the hands of the devil, that is, if you don't consent to his temptations and harassments, you will never be injured by the guilt of sin in any temptation. Instead, you'll actually be strengthened by the temptation as long as you open the eyes of your mind to see my love and to understand why I allowed you to be tempted so you could develop virtue by having it proved. My love permits these temptations for the devil is weak. He can do nothing by himself unless I allow him. So I let him tempt you because I love you, not because I hate you. I want you to conquer, not to be conquered, and to come to a perfect knowledge of yourself and of me. And this is from Thomas Kempis. God, our Father, we are exceedingly frail and indisposed to every virtuous and gallant undertaking. Strengthen our weakness, we beseech you, so that we may do valiantly in the spiritual war. Help us against our own negligence and cowardice and defend us from the treachery of our own unfaithful hearts. For Jesus Christ's sake, amen. And from St. John Chrysostom, one of the most prolific of the early writers of the early church, the early church fathers, and I really like him. I've read a lot of his stuff. He's really cool. Lord, stretch out your mighty hand and your sublime and holy arm, and in your watchful care look down upon me, your creature, and send down upon me a peaceful angel, a mighty angel, a guardian of soul and body who will rebuke and drive away every evil and unclean demon from me. For you alone are Lord most high, almighty and blessed unto ages of ages. Eternal God, you who have redeemed the race of men from the captivity of the devil, deliver me your servant from all the workings of unclean spirits. Command the evil and impure spirits and demons to depart from the soul and body of your servant and not to remain nor hide in me. Let them be banished from me, the creation of your hands, in your own holy name and that of your only begotten Son and of your life-creating Spirit so that after being cleansed from all demonic influence, I may live godly, justly, and righteously, and may be counted worthy to receive the holy mysteries of your only begotten Son and our God, with whom you are blessed and glorified, together with the all-holy and good and life-creating Spirit, now and ever and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Okay, that's cool. All right. That's cool. That'd be right, cool. Man. I'm going to go eat some food. I'm hungry. I'm hungry, too. Yeah, nice. Good job. <laughs> you Way too, to Brian. Way to go, Marilyn. You too, Brian. All right, we'll talk to you later. Okay, bye, Brian. Bye.